Hello again, folks. It's Dr. Jeff Camarda with a piece called Last Minute Tax Tips and Tactics, Part 1. So, it's March again, and the tax madness musters anew. For those who yearn to file by April 17th, the pressure is beginning to build. Before the mad dash takes off in earnest, in just a few short weeks, you may want to brush up on the big disruptions to the tax code wrought by last year's tax reform. You'll be dealing with some of the biggest changes in a generation, so be warned. Besides fundamental restructuring like the elimination of exemptions, there are more changes this year than have been seen in quite some time. All the new rules will add mightily to the confusion, so best get a jump on it if you've not already begun. Worse, worse, many old and cherished tax tactics have gone by the wayside, and if you're not careful, the new tax cuts, and there are cuts, but they're not all cuts, the new, the new tax cuts may wind up biting your wealth instead of reducing your taxes. Tax strategy, always important to wealth maximizers, should be especially scrutinized this year. Before jumping in, it is useful to remember that U.S. tax policy and law is in constant flux. It's a seething, changing thing driven by the complex and fickle political wind. The battlefield is ever shifting and readers are advised to keep a sharp and frequent lookout to chart the safest path through the fire and carnage. Like so many changes before it, the new tax reform is short-lived with many provisions sunsetting, expiring, after 2025 if they even last that long. The future Congresses and President may extend them or cancel them or cut them way back. Taxes may go up or down or stay the same. Tax policy breeds many unintended consequences and creates change constantly with new winners and new losers. So keep a sharp eye out. For now, we'll mostly address income taxes since the urgency of these is probably why you're watching this video, but please be attentive to our, up our up upcoming thoughts on the much more insidious estate tax, which will be covered in another piece the video, probably part three of this, though I will get into it a bit in part two. So here are some highlights of the big changes. Number one, the estate tax. The estate tax exemption has been doubled to $11,180,000 per individual, almost $22.4 million per married couple, which should make for far fewer taxable estates. Just remember, this may change at the whim of the next government, and that in any event, the exemptions revert to the old level in 2026. So if, um, well, if you're looking to avoid estate taxes and you're in, uh, in, that, uh, in that league, um, you may want to think about moving things along before 2026, just kidding. Employee business expenses and other miscellaneous deductions, W-2 employees, as opposed to independent contractors or business owners, have always had the short end of the stick when it comes to business write-offs, where the small range of allowable deductions got whittled down to almost nothing by the arithmetic on the old Schedule A. Well, the short end of the stick's now been whittled down to nothing, the stick is gone, and employees no longer have any write-off opportunities whatsoever. Ditto for moving expenses, brokerage and IRA and investment advisory fees, new alimony, and most casualty losses. If these items apply to you, you could see significant tax increases where possible setting up or using an own business to expense applicable items could offer substantial relief. Number three. Exemptions and itemized deductions. The standard deduction has been effectively doubled, changing the calculus of whether to itemize things like charitable contributions, home interest, and so on. Complicating the calculus, there are no more personal exemptions. This is really a sea change, a very fundamental change. Exemptions were basically a bonus deduction based on the size of the, ta the, the eligible taxpayer's family and available regardless of whether you itemized other deductions or not. The exemptions basically took a chunk of money, depending how big your family was, and just lopped that off your, uh, um, your adjusted gross income, reducing um, the, uh, the, the, the income on which tax would be calculated. Um, Available regards. So it didn't make any difference before whether you took deductions, itemized deductions, or took the standard deduction. But now, depending on your situation, 
the lack of the exemptions can dramatically blunt the value of the expanded standard deduction. They took the standard deduction, went like this. They took the exemptions, went like this to zero. So we're, you know, where are the chips falling? Really, you know, complicated and confusing. The limits for charitable deductions are slightly expanded. The so-called SALT for state and local tax deduction is curtailed with a sum of income, real estate, and sales taxes capped at 10000 Business owners can continue to deduct these items if they qualify as business use. So look carefully. And finally, the nasty stealth tax on deductions were an arithmetic shell game of now you see them, now you don't eliminate deductions or whittle them way, way down for higher income folks, effectively boosting their tax rate, is gone under the new tax regimen. Number four, capital gains rates stay the same at 0, 15, and 20 percent, also a prog progressive tax, plus uh, not to pick any nits, uh, if applicable, of the 3.8 percent Obama era net investment income tax kicker. That's a nit. Remember, the capital gains rates are determined by ordinary income rates. In other words, having sufficient business, interest, employment, or other regular income will drive the effective capital gains rates higher. According to financial commentator, my friend Michael Kitsis, because capital gains income stacks on top of what I'm quoting here, on top of ordinary income, even just increasing ordinary income can effectively crowd out room for preferential long-term capital gains rates. In fact, the interrelationships between ordinary income and long-term capital gains creates a form of capital gains bump zone where the marginal tax rate at ordinary income can end up being substantially higher than the household's tax bracket alone because additional income is both subject to ordinary tax brackets and drives up the taxation of long-term capital gains or qualified dividends in the process. Boy, Michael, that was a mouthful, but the, the really essential point is all the, the taxes are, in, it, it, it's a system of interrelated pieces and you need to run the math to see how you'll be impacted. Um, and it really makes sense to do the last minute uh, tax strategizing before the end of the tax year. Anyway, that's it for now. In part two and subsequent parts, we'll d uh, dwell a bit more on the estate and gift taxes, look at changes in the so-called kitty tax, review an important, really important change on IRA Roth conversions, and look at the many huge changes affecting business owners. Until then, as Franklin didn't say, but should actually, I said it, but as Franklin didn't say, but should have, taxes saved is wealth earned. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, this is Dr. Jeff Camarda. By the way, I'm very, very honored to have been hired by Forbes to write for Forbes.com. So we'll go ahead and follow me at Forbes.com. If you just Google Camarda and Forbes in the same Google phrase, uh, you'll find my stuff pretty fast. Thanks. See you soon.